this type of seminars so that the exact information comes to all of the people so i welcome you all again on the second webinar on orthobiologics and thank you all for being here thank you thank you so much thank you so much for the nice words so uh, our committee member professor uh, tanmay mohanty sir has already joined welcome dr tanmay mohanty sir are you here yeah so we have uh, we can start right now because uh, our secretary general is not able to be in touch so i'll once again welcome all to this uh, important webinar first we did it in january and the subject was uh, prp the uses of prp the indications for the prp and now we are into the bone grafts and the theme is bone graft and orthobiologics are they correlated yes they are very much correlated and this we are going to discuss in uh, like a few one hour so over to the chairs i welcome the chairs for this session one professor tanmay mohanty from bhuvaneshwar uh, dr mohanty are you here dr tanmay mohanty sir are you here i think hello can you hear me yeah yeah we can hear you we can't see you welcome uh, sir welcome sir so you are chairing the first session and uh, please give the permission so that we can start and we can have all the discussion all the questions after each session welcome sir so the first oh. uh, speaker is dr uh, pakki ratnam the most most important thing about the basics about bone graft recapitulating the bone graft properties and biology over to dr pakki dr pakki ratnam very good afternoon sir 200 mark yeah sir am i audible sir yeah you are able yeah. to share your yeah. screen thank you sir thank you i thank ioa and iscg for giving me this opportunity it's really a privilege to present to even appear before all these stalwarts and over to my presentation now sir um shall i start sharing my screen sir? please 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 yeah go ahead sir is it okay yeah I'll be giving just a in small introduction about the recapitulation of the bone grafts. So these are my associations. I am working as an assistant professor in Bombay Medical College in Chennai, Tamil Nadu. I have been associated with I O A, uh, our uh, prestigious I A C S G S, and our I O A uh, Institute of Orthopedic Dermatology uh, Association. Sir. So we have we know that bone graft is harvested from various sites, and there are various types and in various forms. so what bone graft is it is a surgical procedure that uses various materials to repair and rebuild the disease or damaged bones and the material that we harvest is what we call as bone grafts may be single or many, many types coming to the biology of bone grafts the bone graft once it is incorporated into a, once it is placed in a site it has to get incorporated so the biology is very important the periosteal uh, presence the uh, adequate amount of angiogenesis some soft tissue coverage around the graft and eventual incorporation into the uh, biology of the surrounding tissues uh, sorry for this uh, slide um, actually these are the various factors associated with the biology and the incorporation of bone graft into the uh, site coming to the properties we can uh, divide it into functional and mechanical properties the functional properties is the indications basically the indications for which we use the bone graft it may be for a structural support of mostly used in articular defects like tibial plateau fractures to prevent post op collapse or even distal tibia fractures or maybe as a void filler in commonly used in orthopedic oncology for after a bone tumor excision or what we commonly use is for the improved healing of fractured non unions and delayed unions coming to the mechanical properties these three is what is considered as the basic properties of any bone graft we have to consider whether, whether the osteoconduction osteoinduction and osteogenesis what are these we can see and specifically osteoconduction is the ability of the material to support or to induce osteoprogenitor cells and eventually lead to bone formation what is osteo this like so this is osteoinduction what is osteoconduction osteoconduction is the ability of the material to act as a matrix as a supporting scaffold 
and finally osteogenesis is the final bone formation by the osteoblastic cells so we divide all the bone grafts based on the their capacity of possessing any of these properties or all of these properties what are the types of bone grafts i'll be just giving a small introduction and the uh, uh, next speakers will be discussing in detail about all these things we can say divide this into autografts allografts bone graft substitutes and all uh, the newer osteoinductive agents the autogenous bone graft is the commonly used autograft or uh, harvested from the patient's own body this is the most commonly used and this is the gold standard available now the this mostly these possess the both all three properties osteoconduction induction and also the osteogenesis what are the types of osteo types of autografts the cortical cancellous free vascular grafts bone marrow aspirate and the recently used reamer irrigate aspirate this is a commonly common sets of uh, harvesting cortical autograft and this shows the cancellous autografts harvested from metaphyseal areas like uh, our radial uh, distal radius polycranon type of proximal tibia and distal femurs this bone marrow aspirate is what we call as bone marrow injection harvested from the iliac crest uh, either the asas or the psas when this is concentrated that we have uh, given as the bone marrow aspirate concept this reamer irrigate aspirate is harvested from the medullary canal of the long bones it is processed and this is also said to process uh, all the three conducting all the all the three bone graft properties finally a small load on how the grafts are kept it may be an onlay graft or an inlay graft onlay graft is placed over the defect site and it may be a single or dual onlay graft and the, this one the inlay graft is creating a a trench inside the defect and keeping the graft inside the defect. Okay. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Over to the next speakers who will be dis discussing in detail. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pak, for you. a wonderful presentation. Thank so uh, the take-home message would be the bone graft. They give a lot of structural support to the articular and non-articular fractures, and especially are useful for the conditions where there is bone cyst and we want to go for a curettage and bone grafting. And as he has very well mentioned, the three properties have to be taken care of before deciding. Becky, you can stop sharing your screen, please. Okay. Three properties which have to be taken care of for deciding which bone graft you're going to opt for. That is osteoconduction, induction, and osteogenesis. We have to work it up very precisely on these three points. And uh, definitely, as been mentioned, autologous and allogenic bone graft. Autologous mm -hmm. are definitely having a limited supply. That's a drawback for which the allogenic graft are been there. And uh, definitely, yes, allogenic bone graft, plentiful being supplied. And there is nowadays, there's no issue about any uh, infection because of the strict processing methods. Uh, definitely, yes, at this point, I would like to say that allogenic, fresh allogenic, fresh frozen and freeze dried form in which fresh frozen nobody uses because of the lot of uh, antigenic property. But yes, fresh frozen and freeze dried are the very wonderful thing which are available. But most of the time, we are not able to utilize them. Uh, we are going to utilize a simple bone graft, autologous, or a, a synthetic bone graft, which you're going to discuss. But yes, we should remember that these two are still upcoming things which you are going to have. Thank you so much. So now we can go to the next presenter. Now, auto and allo human graft. Comparative study is very important, which I was just telling, auto and allo human. So over to Dr. Naveen Jairaman for precisely comparing both these activities. Dr. Naveen Jaram, he's from Trichy. Dr. Naveen, Hello. yeah. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, you are audible. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. Today, Thank you. Today, my topic is auto and allo graft human, auto and allo human graft comparative activity. So let us discuss this topic in brief in upcoming slides. Coming to autographs, autographs has the highest degree of osteogen. Dr. Naveen, can Hello? you do the slide can sharing mode? Slide sharing mode, you're not on the slide sharing mode. Okay, okay, one minute, sir. No, sir. No. It's a slide. Yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. Oh. 
coming to my topic autograph autograph have the highest degree of osteogenic potential which is non antigenic and vascularization is also quick because the cancellous graft have good pore size and with large surface area for revascularization property as well as autograft have the property of osteo inductive and osteo conductive there are two types of autograft one is cancellous autograft and cortical autograft coming to cancellous autograft this is considered as, as cancellous we can able to do vascularized or non vas non vascularized cancellous autograft is the most commonly graft used in our orthopedic practices and it is considered as gold standard why gold standard because it has both osteogenic property and good rapid revascularization property the resorptive phase of the cancellous autograft is very short compared to cortical graft why because it has the good pore size which will help to the rapid revascularization property and where are these grafts available and where we will harvesting this one is mainly the anterior and posterior superior iliac spine these are the two most commonly sites where the, we are harvesting the cancellous autografts tibia proximal tibia especially the metaphyseal region and greater trochanter and condyles of the femur medial malleolus olecranon and distal radius what this uh, one of the um, disadvantage of this cancellous autograft is it doesn't have any osteo conduct sorry any mechanical strength coming to cortical autograft the subcutaneous anteromedial aspect of tibia is the excellent source of the cortical autograft harvesting which provides the mechanical support to fill the huge defect especially in trauma cases or tumor cases where there is a big void we can able to use as a filler cortical graft and we can use for the it provides mechanical stability also one of the disadvantages is removal of this huge graft it adds to the duration and magnitude of the surgery convalescence is prolonged and ambulation may be delayed till the defect has to be filled and the harvesting site it has to be protected to prevent the refracture also this is the disadvantage of the cortical autograft coming to allograft where the allograft is useful especially in small children or aged patients uh, who are poor for the operative risk and whom enough amount of autologous bone is not available this kind of patients we will prefer to use allograft accession of autograft sorry allografts have genetic disparity which evoke variable immune responses with revascularization and early resorption of allograft previous foreign antigens are also exposed which causes low grade inflammation reaction also so attenuation of antigenicity with the preservation of osteogenic property and metaphyseal strength so how allografts allograft there are i am not going to detail how the allograft is harvested because bone bank is also a separate topic coming to allograft it is preserved by deep piecing and our piece drying retain their structural properties pre dried allograft can become fragile to torsion or bending forces along the collagen fibers of the allograft hence deteriorating their mechanical strength because there are various um, methods they will harvest the graft as well as the processing the graft this processing techniques will reduce the property of they will reduce the osteogenic property of the allografts this we should keep in mind allografts have many advantages the one is the as i previously mentioned it have the abundant supply of the graft material so now we need to compromise the host structures to obtain one of the drastic disadvantage of the allograft is that this is transmission coming especially hiv or hepatitis blood borne disease transmission which is estimated to be around 1 by 1 in 1.6 million cases so this is a um, brief idea about the autograft and allograft comparative activity autograft harvesting from the same patient allograft harvesting from the different patient tissue and there is less chance of projection and infection is in autograft allograft will have high chance of rejection especially due to antigenic property as well as infection also transmissible and the autograft processing it does not require any stringent processing but allograft we should be careful about the bone banking details and all this is the latest literature about the bone bone graft tuberculosis which is alarming in usa when and in india also we should keep this in mind because india is more prone for it's endemic for tuberculosis so we also should be careful about the process in and uh, history taking from when we harvesting allograft especially allograft from the other stream we should able to get the proper history from the patient attenders or somewhere because in the also uh, endemic in tuberculosis and uh, this paper we got back uh, because there was a literature from usa stating that a bone bank uh, sorry bone graft uh, tuberculosis is alarming in their country so we should also keep and educate our community especially orthopedic community about this bone graft tuberculosis because we are the most commonly using the from 
tissues from the bone bone bank especially for uh, tumor cases or uh, defe massive defect cases so in future we should be able to analyze uh, rule out this bone graft tuberculosis before processing into the tumor cases thank you thank you so much thank you so much dr navin for a wonderful presentation now i think audience would be very much clear about what the organisms are used for especially the freeze dried and the fresh frozen form uh, now uh, our secretary general and our convener professor bhushan they are all here so we are just going to stay back for few minutes to have a welcome note from them over oh, firstly to dr navin thakkar who is on the way right now he stopped uh, please stop sharing navin yes sir over to dr navin thakkar navin are you able to hear us yes 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 can you hear me yeah yeah properly we can hear you thank you so much yes 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 so sorry for that disturbance because i was traveling and uh, from the iu office and on the iu side we are very much thankful to dr manish kanna dr dp bhushan sir for convening this uh, great webinar on orthobiology and orthobiology committee is working very hard for uh, academic activity in all io committees thank you so same much same way the rheumatology committee is also working very hard for all uh, inputs about the rheumatology these are the branches where the delegates wants more and more information because they are not aware of many new things and the faculty has prepared very well and uh, worked hard to give you a more and more things so this is really a sharing contributing and learning together so we all are learning together and we are exchanging our ideas and uh, the way we can solve the better our uh, patients in the india but particularly with the economical constraints this is a fantastic program and i wish on behalf of indian orthopedic association a great success to this program Thank you Dr. so much, Deepi Bhutan sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Manish Kanna sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. So now over to Professor D. P. Bhushan sir, who is the convener, the backbone of uh, our committee. <laughs> Professor D. P. Bhushan, sir, are you here? Yes, yes. Are you listening to me? Yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Welcome, sir. Welcome. <laughs> Actually, I was also traveling. I am traveling rather. Uh, there is a background which is not showing that I am traveling. Uh, Naveen, one thing to uh, tell you in orthobiologic uh, seminars and webinars that we are very precise and very short. We are not making it boring. This is number one. Number two, I welcome everybody, including all the officials and all the speakers of this orthobiologic group. Successful. I am also thankful to Naveen. Who has somehow recognized that orthobiology is doing also very very well, and you do very very much to all the speakers, and I know that you will make it a success. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for the kind words. So, with the permission of uh, Dr. Agunandan sir, we'll move to the next uh, presentation for the case report and discussion on infected bone graft. hold your seats very tight it's a very interesting case report by dr suresh we are which we can commonly correlate in our clinical practice over to dr suresh for the case report and the discussion and then we'll have a discussion on, on the three subjects dr raghunand yes dr suresh you can share yes sir uh, good afternoon everyone good the screen is visible sir yeah, yeah. please go ahead yeah Uh, so this is a case report of a 31 year old male patient who had a history of road traffic accident because of the head on collision with a four wheeler while traveling on a two wheeler so he was initially uh, diagnosed with a type 3b compound fracture this was in the month of july of 2017 so he was diagnosed with a type 3b compound fracture of the proximal tibia for which at a local hospital he had a wound debridement along with a orif with a proximal tibial lcp so this is the earliest post operative radiograph which is available with the which was available with the patient this was taken in the month of october so if you carefully see this x ray there is a gap at the fracture site and along with that there is a sclerosed medial cortical bone which appears to be sequestrated so we waited this was taken in october so we waited until the completion of 6 months that is till uh, february of 2018 for any improvement to be seen in this patient this patient was after 6 months also patient was non weight bearing 
and the, uh, radiologically there was no evidence of any callus appearing at the fracture site. So we labeled it as a non-union and what could be the causes of this non-union? It could be inadequate stability, maybe the plate is not holding the fracture fragments together and it is not throwing the callus or it could be inadequate reduction as is evident there is a gap at the fracture site. Or as I told you earlier, it is a compound fracture. So there could be some amount of subclinical infection, which is not allowing a callus to be grown. Or there is a, a soft tissue is very poor surrounding the bony uh, fracture site, which is not allowing, enabling the callus formation. So what treatment options do we have? Either all these were the options that we were in front of us. With our, uh, either go for in-situ bone grafting or do a debridement, then put a bone graft and revise the plate or go for a debridement and a staged reconstruction that is nothing but a masculine two-stage reconstruction, or we remove the plate, put an X-fix, do a thorough debridement, and then go for a secondary ORIF with the bone graft. Or lastly, the best would be Elizero. But what we have done, so in the month of February of 2018, that is six months after the initial surgery, we have taken this patient uh, into the OT. We checked for the stability and there was the stability was good. The plate was actually stable enough, providing adequate stability. So we removed the medial sequestrated bone and we impacted the fracture site with the bone graft. Cancellous bone graft was taken from the iliac crest, autologous. And then we augmented this fixation using this uh, recon plate, which was placed anteromedially. The basic aim, the main aim of this plate was to hold the bone graft, which was impacted at the fracture site in place so that it does not get displaced out. Uh, so uh, the, the best option of the play implant would have been a medial bro profile, medial tibial plate. But however, in view of the financial constraints, we have to use this recon plate only. Now, post-operative phase, at the, on the fifth day of the post-op, there was a discharge from the surgical site, which was zero coolant along with the bony spicules. We got CRP and CPP done. CRP was raised and the counts were within normal range. So we made an impression of early infected bone graft. So why infection happened? It could be either an intraoperative contamination or it could be preoperative. Some amount of infection was there subclinically at the fracture site, which got flared up with the bone graft. Or there could be some systemic causes of infection, which were systemic loci of infection from where the infection migrated to the bone graft site. Whatever it is, now the burning issue at hand was to tackle this infected bone graft. So how to handle these complications and how far should we go? Whether removal of the infected bone graft alone is in, uh, adequate or we should go for a thorough debridement and IV antibiotic or we should also remove the implant and put uh, X-fix or L0 or altogether should we go for a two-state limb reconstruction techniques. So what we did, instead of all this, we instead passed an infant feeding tube through the discharge site from where the pus was coming out. Through this infant feeding tube, we put in, we instilled one gram of vancomycin, which were diluted to three ml once a day for a three days. But it, care was taken that this installation was carried out for a minimum of 15 minutes, not less than 15 minutes. On third day, the wound was dry enough. There was no more discharge. And on the 10th day of following these procedures, the suture was removed and patient was sent back home. What is the rationale why we did this? We have often seen that uh, spine surgeons often use vancomycin along with their bone graft when they are going for the spinal fusion procedures. This, in fact, is for the prophylaxis of the surgical site uh, infection. But however, in our case, the infection has already settled. But being an early bone graft infection, we were sure that there was a chunk of the bone graft still which is not infected. And this bone graft can act as a local reservoir of the bone graft it, uh, of the antibiotic if it takes up this antibiotic. So once we instill the uh, antibiotic at this site, it not only takes care of the local infection, but also once this antibiotic gets impregnated into the bone graft, it acts as a carrier of antibiotic for coming four to six weeks, which can take care of the local infection. Now, this was a documented evidence. Now, what were the concerns that came to our mind while uh, advocating, advocating this kind of treatment? The first concern was the negative effect of vancomycin on the osteoblastic activity on the bone graft. We have reviewed the literature and have uh, came up with the conclusion that the toxic effect of vancomycin on the viability of the functionality of this osteoblastic cells present in the bone graft is only transient and only short term. Over a long period of time, it does not impact the bone graft uh, osteogenic activities. Therefore, vancomycin can be safely administered or used along with the bone graft. Now, the second uh, concern was how is it different from a pulse lavage? Lavage is nothing but a wound wash, wherein it's an inflow outflow model, wherein we want everything, we are putting something and we want all the contamination to come out along with that. 
Whereas in this technique of wound tabulating, we want to put something in and we want it to stay there along with the material that is the bone graft so that it can incorporate and get uh, and take care of next four to six weeks of the local antibiotic uh, MIC. Now coming to the outcome, this was a post six months post-operatively, we can see the graft has been taken up and is consolidating pretty well. The first year follow-up, we can see the there is adequate consolidation at place. And this is two years follow-up X-ray, post-op X-ray. This is bone, <laughs> thoroughly consolidated and well taken up bone graft. This was done immediately before the implant removal. The implant was removed in the July of 2021 because we plan to carry out uh, knee, certain knee procedures there because there was an IDK, some internal derangement of the knee as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And now over to our... Uh... Uh, chairs, Dr. Raghunandan, he's a very senior orthopedic surgeon from Chennai. He has a special interest in joint preservation surgery. He's a stalwart and working in Apollo Hospital, Chennai, and also attached to the Muscat for Gulf Specialized Service. Over to Dr. Raghunandan for his comments for these three presentations, anything which we can take forward. And then over to Tanmay Mohanty, sir. So the, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it's an interesting presentation about how things can go wrong. Uh, the first step where the non-union due to a uh, gap and a possible subclinical infection and how a bone graft second procedure also almost uh, led to a big disaster. But an intelligent way of tackling uh, things, you know, the present uh, scenario, I think that is more important, you know, rather than going more radical procedure and taking up the burden further up, you know, so the bone graft is going to stay there. It's not going to move out anywhere. And uh, as he, the author clearly mentioned, that vancomycin is like a, going to act as an impregnated bone graft. Okay, so vancomycin toileting, the vancomycin is going to adhere to the bone graft, which is already there. So if you try to wash out, I think the bone graft can be washed out. But instead of that gentle toileting, so the, the vancomycin can get impregnated in the bone graft. That can help uh, both ways, uh, bone healing as well as uh, getting, getting rid of the infection. I think probably adding that uh, middle plate is a little too much, I think. Because already the stability of the graft, uh, the implant was good, and uh, the bone graft is not going to come out anywhere. Don't worry about that. As long as you close the periosteum perfectly. Very, so. very good. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Over to Professor Tanmay Mohanty, sir, for your expert comments, sir. I see the young surgeons have put forth all the points in a very not cell in a short time. Yeah, yeah, sir. Roughly, we feel with our experience that uh, the best is the patient's bone. Correct. And uh, when it's not available, we have to think of massive bone and other things. And as we go away from the patient's own bone, the chances of infection are little more. And second thing, the young surgeons who will be mostly using the stem cells and other things, we have to consider one thing, that majority of the stem cell uh, producing things they have a lot of, uh, they are lot, uh, very well affected by presence of antibiotics. So sometimes in a presence of infection, when we are going to use antibiotics, we have to be very careful because the material what we are going to use, if have been started from stem cells or we are depending on the stem cells for their progressive nature, maybe they will be affected by presence of these antibiotics. That is why you will see that a lot of studies are being done and the papers are coming out. The effect of antibiotics during changes in the stem cell work. Otherwise, the now we knew that the patient is giving its own bone, bone to another site. We find it is quite good. But the moment we are taking bone substitutes or we are trying to take allograft, there is a possibility of infection and this is how we will share our experience on certain conditions without going into a very aggressive surgery, sometimes we can save the bone. I think that is enough. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect, sir. Thank you so much for your wise inputs. So now we come to enter this first form of orthobiologics. And now it's my turn for the second form of orthobiologics. And I'll just share my screen with the permission. So let me, I think there is some issues, just a second.
yeah here it is so yep. so second form of orthobalgics is bone marrow aspirate and bmac we have just discussed it a few minutes back and you'll be very precisely going to tell what is the difference between the two it's a, it's a bone marrow aspirate is something uh, just like a holy color which orthopedic surgeon plays sometime our professors used to ask us to use it whenever there was a delayed union and whenever we are going to insert a needle to take out a bone marrow aspirate actually we are entering into an area which is called as stem cell niche so stem cell niche is a area which is maybe there in the allic crest which may be there in the sternum which may be there in the upper part of the tibia whatever it may be so this area is a micro environment plus area in which the stem cell live happily and they multiply and reside so whenever the bone marrow aspirate we take it out we are just taking it out with the mood of having hematopoietic stem cells very few mesenchymal stem cell undifferentiated population of progenitor cells and lot of growth factors has been discussed just before uh, this presentation now these mesenchymal stem cells or hematopoietic stem cell they secrete growth factor which are actually the boon which are actually the things which give results to us the cells are not giving the results the growth factors are giving the results what the results may be anti inflammatory property which may be requiring any immunomodulatory property like in the rheumatoid arthritis regenerative properties like again in a delayed union non union pro engineering properties like in critical ischemia or a diabetic foot ulcer with a calcification anti fibrotic properties even you know not in the field of orth uh, orthopedics but yes even with the sub mucous fibrosis if you are going to inject a prp or a bone marrow as concentrate you are going to have a fibrinolysis even a scar can be uh, make it very thin form so these are the so advantages but we are concerned with the orthopedics only so this bone marrow aspirate is a osteogenic liquid content now coming to the mesenchymal cells which are been there so they exist very less practically very less that is the my aim for this presentation is like 1 into 50000 ratio to the nucleated cell you can understand how much less they are the most important thing to remember is if we are planning for any osteogenic activity taking out a bone marrow aspirate and then concentrating it for a older person definitely we are going to deal a lesser msc's because they decrease with the age as compared to the younger generation and definitely these concentrate or these aspirate of course aspirate also they can be combined with the oste all the type of osteoconductive matrix which we are discussing this afternoon one should remember with the uh, guidelines which have been issued to us ideally a bmac that is bone marrow concentrate should be autologous and homogeneous that means you have you should take out a bone marrow aspirate and then make a concentrate of it and to utilize it at the same point that means if you are dealing with upper end of the tibia you should take it out from there and utilize it is there utilize it there it is practically little not possible because of various reasons so that is why a autologous bone graft concentrate in a ot converting into a aspirate and sorry aspirate converting into a concentrate using it autologous autologously in the any part of the body maybe in the tibia or maybe in uh, avian head of the femur will do the work and one should remember the sites to be aspirated off means the progenitor cells which we are dealing with which you want to play with they are also depending upon the different different site for example the iliac crest which is the most common useful site it has abundant amount of the progenitor cells as compared to the other areas so what are the other areas to fill up it distal tibia distal femur proximal humerus sternum calcaneum and a list is long but practically we play with the allic crest either with the posterior superior spine and anterior superior spine definitely posterior superior spine is better because you will have a more concentrated and you can take out a more amount of bone marrow aspirate and then concentrate to form it to form a concentrate now this is a very important slide which i have played intentionally here dr david herrell has said that i am always suspicious because this is a very common thing with the uh, with the people who are just going to use to play with the bone marrow aspirate making a concentrate that i am always suspicious that when we centrifuge a bone marrow aspirate we might be throwing away the significant aspect of regenerative properties of the balgics so this is actually not happening uh, properly and we don't 
decrease it, but definitely it's a minimal manipulation. There may be some effect, but we need to concentrate it. And the machine which are being used technically are the cold centrifuge. One should remember the mononuclear cell viability, which is you which you obtain a, from the concentrate, should be ninety percent by flow cytometry, which is again not a very easy task at the district level to see a flow cytometric analysis. Here you can see a slide in which the mononuclear cells have been uh, seen the staining. Even a nubus chamber in your OT can help you out to find out what your concentrate is all about. So technically, if you compare BMA or BMAC, so BMA is just the bone marrow aspirate, which is present in the body or outside the body. And the concentrate is having a higher concentration of the cell. You can see here the buffy coat layer, which is having a BMAC. Now, definitely the BMAC have a diverse cell population, heterogeneous cell population of the material, starting from the mononuclear cells to hematopoietic stem cell and very few MSCs. It is very important to remember that bone marrow processing should be done within four to six hours of after the aspiration as per the FDA guidelines. Uh, it is just like a golden, a golden period, just like in a trauma, we have a golden rule. And definitely, yes, little bit of MSC count is increased, but not gradually. You can see here 0.001 to 0.01%. So practically, you can say there is no MSC count which is available. So how we are going to have the benefit from the bone marrow concentrates? Since it is having hematopoietic cells, it is having a few bit of undifferentiated cells. So they're going to do their job by the fibroblast activity, chondrogenesis, osteoblast genesis, and it is all because of the growth factor. This heterogeneous nature of the bone marrow cell in the BMAC is complemented, as been mentioned earlier also, by the growth factors. We are only bothering about these growth factors, nothing with the cells, and the cytokines like interleukin-8, interleukin-1RA, secreted by the MSCs, they do a wonderful job for the inflammation process. So here are the various applications which we're going to go with to today in the presentation of the use of the bone marrow concentrate in various form. Thank you so much for the patient hearing. So uh, now we go to the, we have off with this uh, second form of orthobiologics and uh, with the permission of the chairs, I'd like to invite Dr. Giri Nivasan for the third form of orthobiologic that is demineralized bone graft, which are the collagen and non collagen products. Over to Dr. Giri. Uh, good Dr. afternoon, Giri. sir. Yeah, good yeah, afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, am I audible, sir? Uh, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the IOA and the Indian Central Study Group uh, and uh, wishing you all a very uh, good afternoon and uh, also happy Easter. I'll uh, start my presentation now. Uh, is my presentation visible, sir? Yeah, it's visible. You can go for the screen sh uh, screen sharing mode. Sorry, the full screen yeah. mode slideshow. So today I'll be talking on uh, demineralized uh, bone matrix, uh, which is one of the uh, uh, bone, substi bo bone graft substitutes available. The other forms of bone graft substitutes will be covered by the subsequent speakers. Mine being the last talk of the sessions, uh, um, I'm going to keep it short to a few slides. So these are these are my affiliations, uh, and um, I'm very humbled to be amidst uh, all the stalwarts here to present my views on this uh, topic. So what is demineralized bone graft? Demineralized bone graft is nothing but a decalcified allogenic alternative. Uh, whether is it a new product uh, in the line? No. As early as uh, 1889, uh, Sen et al. used oxen tibia uh, to uh, Treat some uh, decalcify uh, to treat some uh, long bone cavities, uh, which was a form of demineralized bone graft. And then uh, by 1965, uh, Urish et al. Uh, derived uh, the human derived demineralized bone graft. And from then on, the demineralized bone grafts have been used then and there, but uh, the evidences are very limited. So, what is the composition? Uh, basically, we are uh, decalcifying uh, the allogenic bone. Uh, so we are removing most of the calcium in it and the residual calcium will be only about 1 to 6%. The main composition is of collagen, which is mainly type 1 collagen and uh, some other types like uh, type 4 and 10. And we also have non-collagenous proteins and also osteoinductive growth factors like uh, bone morphogenic proteins. So what are the properties? The properties uh, reflect the composition of the bone demineralized bone graft. One is osteoinductive properties since they contain some growth factors and uh, bone morphogenic proteins. And the 3D configuration of the collagen and non-collagen proteins uh, provides, it's an, uh, provides it uh, 
osteo conductive property as well and they are uh, essentially non immunogenic uh, uh, because of their uh, preparation method so one property that we can see that is uh, lacking is the osteogenic property uh, which is uh, present only in the autografts so the merits are very obvious uh, we uh, have will have no donor site morbidity and it shortens the surgery time and is available in abundant amount however um, uh, there is it is less immunogenic when compared to the allografts available so there are various forms available over the years different forms have been developed the first uh, uh, pre previously used forms were uh, powdered forms which are loose and did not hold properly to the Uh, impregnated site then came the blocks these blocks um, took time to integrate and sometimes after integration they left a dead space uh, now finally the two most commonly used forms are the paste or the putty form which is uh, firm and it holds well and the other form is the moldable form of demineralized bone graft where the powder is reconstituted with the viscous carriers there are different viscous carriers uh, available and uh, they don't have uh, much significance in the efficacy Uh, as described by Jang et al, these uh, carriers can be classified broadly into polymer carriers and low molecular carriers. The low molecular carriers can be further uh, classified into glycerol, calcium uh, sulfate, and bioactive glass. Whereas the polymer carriers can be classified into chitosan, um, hyaluronic acid, which is uh, most commonly used, sodium alginate, carboxymethylcellulose type one collagen, and uh, uh, polyoxamer four zero seven, which is a synthetic product. Product. so these are the uh, different commercial forms that are available and uh, i'm not going to go in details of uh, all these forms um, coming to the clinical uses which is uh, very important uh, as a clinician for us to know uh, the first uh, first thing that i would like to tell uh, and point out is uh, there is only limited evidence of uh, comparison of these products with the various other bone graft substitute substitutes available Mm, and from the limited evidence, uh, uh, important use uh, is seen in uh, trauma, as summarized by Brink et al. in his review paper published in uh, 2021 in Injury Journal. So he has compared the allografts and demineralized bone graft, and he has summarized the evidences available. So as I already uh, listed uh, in the previous slide, the demineralized bone grafts have only two properties: osteoconduction and osteoinduction. When comparing the allografts, the osteoinductive potential of uh, demineralized bone graft is higher for two reasons. Uh, first reason uh, being the uh, con amount of uh, growth factors and uh, bone morphogenic proteins that are present. However, we can't quantify the amount of bone morphogenic protein that is present in the demineralized bone graft. Uh, so this claim can also be questionable. Uh, one thing that is uh, lacking in the demineralized bone graft when compared to the structural allograft is the mechanical support that the structural allograft provides. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, sir. Sorry for the interruption. So the uh, one. Um, the in comparison with the structural allograft uh, the demineralized bone graft can be used only in uh, metaphyseal bony defects uh, in long bone defects it's questionable it can be mixed with the allograft or uh, autograft and can be used in fracture non unions also it can be used as a graft extender and uh, this, this is the final summary the osteoinduction is uh, present only in demineralized bone graft and compared to allograft and osteoconduction is present in both whereas mechanical support is present only in the allograft Uh, safety is higher in the demineralized bone graft and it's easy to convince the patient since it's a commercially available product and uh, allograft is taken from some other source and the second application is seen in spine as uh, summarized by shepherd et al uh, in spine the evidence is uh, quite promising uh, since we have the local grafts during uh, the removal of uh, um, okay, during the curettage of locally curating the bone available it can be mixed readily with the demineralized bone graft and used for fusion procedures and uh, there are a few comparative studies including a randomized trial uh, which uh, provide comparable outcomes when compared to the iliac crest bone graft however limited data is available in uh, deformity correction surgeries so coming to the limitations there is no ideal uh, dbm product as i summarized before there are a lot of commercial available products uh, there even uh, two batch uh, two products from the same batch of a same company will have different uh, potentials uh, because uh, it is based on the host Uh, from which uh, the demineralized bone graft is obtained and based on the growth factor concentrations and there is no osteogenic uh, property and variable osteoinductive property is there 
and uh, we couldn't define ideal conditions on when to use adenylase bone graft when to use hydroxybutyrate when to use tricalcium phosphate etc and the combined use of dbn and allogeneic stem cell products like bmac is coming up and there is very very limited data available and this can be the future of uh, bone graft substitutes as combining them with the bone uh, bone marrow aspirate provides us uh, the osteogenic potential as well so the take home message will be osteo inductive and osteo conductive potentials are available for the demon less bone graft but they are variable they are good as uh, local graft extenders in spine surgery and can be mixed with allo graft and in met metaphyseal defects they can be used standalone also however for long long bone defects they can be used as standalone as they don't provide mechanical support there are a large number of products but the evidence is very limited thank you sir thank you so much for excellent presentation and uh, i think the take home message is very easy why this subject of uh, uh, this uh, orthobalgics we have taken it because now with the bmac you can add on these uh, substitutes and uh, these component and you can have osteogenesis which is not been there so that is the most important thing which should, we should remember and definitely yes one thing i want to add is the bone morphogenic protein so these products when the acid dimin act and the product is collagen proteins non collagen protein so we have also bone morphogenic proteins available in these uh, matter and these bone marrow uh, proteins they are going to decrease in amount with the uh, processing which has been done that's a demerit and i want to act on one thing that uh, will clear it here again we have discussed many time we orthopedic surgeon we played with the bone graft and it is a general practice these days or uh, previous days also that to take out a bone graft and place it in a normal saline on the ot table so it should not be there why the reason is when you are taking a bone graft out anything which you are going to take it out and if you are going to use a normal saline your bmps will going to wash away because the bmp the proteins are very important they initiate the bone formation especially converting the mesenchymal cell line to the osteobatic lineage which we want ultimately by doing a placing a simple bone graft in the operating table and definitely yes the collagen which is there it's a wonderful uh, 3d model in which you can have growth of the capillaries blood vessels and whatever the bmac you are going to put it is going to do the job that is the most important thing thank you so much now uh, i would like to uh, we can go for the next session thank you so much and uh, we will request uh, dr navaldi shankar who is here to chair the session dr navaldi shankar are you here Dr. Navaldi Shankar, are you? Yeah, here? hello. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm yeah. here. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm listening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You are. A, he's a senior consultant orthopedic surgeon from Chennai, and he's specially interested in orthobalgics. He has started orthobalgic department also uh, in the reputed uh, Apollo Hospital, Green City. Over to Navaldi Shankar, sir, for uh, your uh, inputs here for the coming uh, presentations. And before wasting uh, much time. i would like to not wasting much time sorry would like to invite the next speaker now coming to the fourth form of orthobalgics that is the bone marrow bone graft substitute which we clinically always use on our ot table over to dr arul from aims bhuvaneshwar for what advantages why and where we are going to use these bone graft substitute dr arul yes sir a uh, very good afternoon to one and all who are joined here and uh, i would like to thank iii and indian stem cell study group for this wonderful opportunity and i would like to thank dr manish kanna sir and navadi shankar sir for chairing this session so i will uh, go through the uh, very important topic of uh, bone graft substitutes in the upcoming slides so why we need this bone graft substitutes we have already have auto grafts and allo grafts and so so the basic uh, indications are when we have a major bone defects following a trauma or following a tumor resections or uh, following a gap non union or when when we are dealing with the periarticular fractures like in the knee or in the uh, hip or acetabulum so according to the statistical estimates approximately 20 million patients worldwide uh, loses bone due to various disease every year so definitely we need an alternative to deal the uh, effect so what is exactly the defect or uh, uh, when we need a bone graft a critically sized bone defect is uh, cannot i mean is considered to not heal spontaneously and they requires surgical intervention so when do we need a diaphyseal defects longer than 1 2 3 cm with a loss of bone circumference of more than 
or uh, or when we are dealing with articular sided defects or when we are following a major resection in orthopedic oncological surgeries and in certain fusion surgeries as well so what are all the ideal substitutes autografts allografts xenografts are available but you know there are certain drawbacks with the autografts and certain disease transmissions and limitations are there with allograft and xenograft so we are moving towards against with any other better alternatives to overcome those drawbacks associated with the previous generation of bone grafts recent research has brought out the biocompatible materials that uh, that cells can adhere to or replace with the extracellular matrix to restore the original tissue so these are these biodegradable materials that can be used for bone defects so basically they are a natural polymers or a synthetic polymers or a ceramic substitutes in terms of a hydroxyapatite or a bioactive class so the first entity what we are regularly using our clinical practice is the ceramic substitutes basically uh, they are composed of a calcium sulfate and calcium uh, phosphate uh, molecules uh, and these molecules are basic of our bone architecture so they are nothing new to our bone so they those structures can be very well impregnated or integrated with our native tissue so that there, there are various types that that are available the first one is the coralline hydroxyapatite that is the basic um, polymer basic uh, molecular structure in our bone and another is the calcium sulfate tricalcium phosphate and bioglass so the basic advantage is that contain calcium and phosphorus these are all the two main minerals of our bone and it remodels very quickly within 6 to 18 months and it very well integrated with our native tissue it it is available in various forms or granules powder and it can be performed into various shapes based upon our defect sizes and structure so the size of macrophores of bone wide filler implants are distributed with a range from 100 to 500 micrometers providing the scaffold for vascularization and migration of osteoclasts and blasts it facilitates regeneration and it can be used alone or it can be mixed with the autografts when we are dealing with a larger volume defects and due to its synthetic origin it alleviates the need alleviates the other uh, uh, infections and prion related disease with those allografts and xenografts so the first entity is the uh, coralline hydroxyapatite it has a very uh, compressive strength than that of the cancellous bone that we generally harvest from our own individual but it has a very long reabsorption rate so that's why the native bone integration is not that much adequate with hydroxyapatite the most common available in our market is the g bone that we everybody aware of that and another is ingenios and chronos that are basically made of beta tcp that is tricalcium phosphate and genex has come up with the newer product bio composite it 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 includes both uh, 50% of uh, calcium sulfate as well as beta tcp so with that addition of uh, beta uh, tcp and uh, calcium sulfate in a, a good ratio it 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 reduces the development of inflammatory pyrophosphates with the beta tcp so the other entity is the bioglass it is a synthetic bioactive bone substitutes that can be used to deal with bone defects it composed mainly of a silica nitrous oxide it uh, the ions released from these uh, glass bone uh, bioglass are very much re has regenerative potential it triggers the osteoblastogenesis and it possesses anti infective and angiogenic properties as well so basically we can use this ceramic scaffolds as simple as that or we can add up some bioactive molecules such as growth factors as manisha told bmp can be added into the ceramic scaffolds or like as uh, uh, previous speaker girisar has told we can add stem cells into the uh, dcm so like that we can add the stem cells into the ceramic scaffolds uh, rather it we, 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 we the, simply the ceramic scaffolds will be osteoconductive upon addition of the stem cells it it it, it, it facilitates all the properties of conductive inductive and uh, all the properties as well so these are all some of the examples you know uh, the subtrochanteric regions are more prone for non union so even with the primary uh, in, in, during the index surgery also we can use this bone uh, bone graft substitutes along with our implant fixation or when we are dealing with the uh, non union following internal cleaning the distal tibia we can put or most commonly you know uh, as a uh, sports medicine specialist following a revision acl the tunnel uh, widened tunnel can be filled up with this bone graft substitutes so the second entity is the composite substitutes it is nothing but the conglomeration of the biodegradable polymers along with this already described biodegradable ceramics so the other substitutes were the metallic substitutes you know basically these are uh, we can we, we should include these in our bone graft substitutes because uh, it facilitates osteo 
conductivity and osteo integration into this material uh, so when we are dealing with the periarticular or intraarticular uh, bone graft defects these metallic uh, bone graft substitutes are very important to hold the uh, native bone tissue so basically we are using a titanium or tantalum kind of things uh, it, it, it is uh, uh, these met these metals are uh, high uh, co composite of making this um, cages and uh, augments uh, when we are dealing with the reconstructive surgeries so this is one of the example when we are having a major defect in the posterior wall that can be augmented with this uh, uh, tantalum augments and following a revision total knee arthroplasty the major defect can be dealt with this metallic uh, tantalum augments so the other entity is the factor based substitutes it includes mainly the natural and recombinant factors such as bone marrow uh, uh, bone morphogenic protein 2 or a, a platelet derived growth factor or insulin uh, uh, like growth factors these are all the main commonly used growth factors in our clinical practice so uh, what we are regularly using is like uh, this recombinant uh, bone marrow uh, bone morphogenic protein 2 that is commonly available as infused from metronics that we are using in spinal fusion surgeries so the final domain is uh, scaffolds it forms a mechanical support and framework where cells can survive thrive and make up the target tissue it act as a building block that that helps fill the tissue gaps and it works in uh, bone tissue as well so that that is possible with the help of bone tissue engineering we should harvest the cell and we should culture it after culturing we should uh, place in the osteoblastic differentiated medium after the cells have been differentiated we can place those cells in the scaffold mm -hmm. and finally the scaffold can be impregnated into the defect size so there are various various uh, poly, uh, various uh, substances that are available to make those scaffolds one of them is the natural polymers such as chitosin chondroitin sulfate collagen silk fibroinin hyaluronin alginate agarose and gelatin but there are certain uh, shortcomings with these natural polymers when we are dealing with these bone defects because of this uh, instability early degradation and possible degeneration during processing and possible immunogenicity so we have make one such novel scaffold made of a chitosin chondroitin sulfate silk fibroin uh, when we are dealing with the osteochondral defects because this uh, chitosin provides a 3d structure to the scaffold chondroitin sulfate is a, a biological polymer that produces the extracellular matrix and silk fibroin it helps the holes it helps uh, as the anchoring uh, point to hold the uh, osteoblast cells what we have impregnated into it and we have come up with this uh, uh, triple polymer scaffold for, for dealing with the osteochondral defects. The other entity is the synthetic polymers. It overcomes the certain drawbacks of these, drawbacks of these natural uh, polymers. The most commonly available synthetic polymers are polycaprolactone and polylactic acid when we are uh, dealing with these bone defects. So we have uh, designed a polycaprolactone L-lactide scaffold and we have conducted animal study based upon this scaffold and we have placed the artificially created bone defect and we have placed the scaffold and we have uh, very well evaluated how it how the bone regenerates over the defect area with the use of this uh, polymer scaffold so the newer modification on this polymer scaffold where uh, where come up with the addition of the uh, osteogenic potential using a nanoparticles one of the nanoparticles what we have used is a simvastatin simvastatin possess a very good osteogenic potential upon stimulation of the transcription factor asterix and rank sector so what is uh, the ideal substitute? Try to summarize your presentation. Yeah, sure, sir. So ideal substitutes, it, it possesses a good biocompatibility and it should have, it possesses porosity, elasticity, mechanical strength, biodegradability should be there. It should be cost effectiveness and it, it, it has to be a easy fabricating material. Long-term effectiveness should be there. It should not possess any toxicity and it, support, it should support for cell attachment and proliferation. So our reason, uh, I mean, our future motto should be like, we should impregnate and design a cellular scaffolds or a growth factor loaded scaffold or a genetic material impregnated for the false point when we are dealing with these bone defects. Uh, so the take home message is bone graft substitutes are inevitable when we are dealing with larger defects and periarticular regions can be used alone or it can be mixed with autographs, uh, autographs for dealing with the large defects. According to the uh, re recent research, uh, 3D printing technology and personalization and customization of such products improve its potential and utility in all domains of orthopedic practice. And further, it alleviates the need of limb lengthening surgeries uh, for cases with major defects. Thank you for patient listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this fourth form of orthobalgics. Uh, we orthopedic surgeon initially were playing with a bone graft, which may be a autologous or allogenic. So you can see how the 
uphill task has reached to the fourth uh, bone graft, orthobalgic, and definitely yes, for a general orthopedic surgeon, again, to summarize it back, we use so many substitutes, which has been there, uh, mentioned here, but we don't use actually most of them. The most commonly hydroxyapatite is better because it has a blessing and disguise with a slow absorption, which we want as compared to the calcium sulfate, which is very rapidly absorbing. Calcium phosphate has a higher concentration, which we require for the strength. But I think with the bone grafting, we are using internal fixation. So strength is again, not a problem. So thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And now before we move to the next form, which is now going to the microscopic level orthobalgics, I would like to ask any of the questions, any of the comments from our respected chairs, Dr. Navaldi Shankar, Dr. Ragunandan, sir, Dr. Uh, Deepa Bhushan, sir, for any comments, anything before moving to the microscopic level of orthobalgics. Yeah, uh, uh, just to add, about it, sir, regular, uh, there's a wonderful talk by you, Professor, regarding the bone marrow concentrate. Uh, and uh, you, have bring, you have brought out a uh, lot of things regarding the use of bone marrow concentrate on the site, what is taken and how much of uh, cells which is available in different sites. And uh, I think it's a big one uh, in the future. Adding your bone marrow concentrate along with the, the new uh, scaffold, what is formed, is uh, definitely going to be a future uh, and a big uh, game in uh, orthobiologics. And a uh, lot of new scaffolds coming up. Even this talk on this new scaffolds, which uh, they are tried uh, in animal studies. I think once it comes out, that also be a good game changer in the orthopedics and treating infected non-unions and other things. Exactly. exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Professor Ragunandan, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, excellent topics uh, present by authors about uh, different types of uh, bone grafts and uh, stem cells, uh, I mean, uh, bone marrow concentrate as well. I think uh, there's something which is uh, not discussed. I would like to add to a few things. Like, you know, how to maximize the local environment, uh, whatever you put. The local environment has to be supporting the bone grafts and the healing potential to make a successful procedure. So I think this is where there comes uh, the well-described established procedure called uh, shingling by Jude, you know, which has been uh, used uh, with or without bone graft for a long time, has given a very successful uh, outcome, you know, when you have a long-standing non-union, particularly atrophic kind of non-union. So with the advent of these uh, stem cells and, you know, the development of microscopic, uh, you know, uh, new products, I think why it has worked, I just know it's curious. I think now it's matching because in the shingling procedure, we take the periosteum with a small chip of particle bone. So probably the osteogenic progenitor cells, which are located just under the uh, periosteum, and the haversion system, which is all opened with the, uh, the uh, shingling procedure. So that progenitor cells acting like a uh, 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 osteoblast. So when you do this procedure in a well-controlled way on either side of the fracture, so these kinds of uh, interconnecting signals and you know the progenitor cells are all mingled with each other. And also the haversion system blood flow also will come out and produce a good environment for the healing process and as the bone graft to be incorporated. The other one is the, when you have a, a situations like an infected non-union, that's a huge gap infected non-union, the masculine procedure, which has been described very well, where you put the cement uh, spacer with a loaded antibiotics, and then after six weeks or eight weeks, it forms a nice vascular pseudomembrane onto which you can always uh, pack bone graft, which has been very successful and uh, with less mobility. So these are the two things which I would like to add. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, especially for using the term shingling. I, I missed this thing. I was just waiting for somebody to point it out. In India, we are still having a lot of poor patients and we need to work up with a lot of economical restrictions, maybe even a using of a BMAC or whatever it may be. Shingling is, as you have rightly pointed out, it's a wonderful procedure. And I would like to add one thing more that with the shingling, actually, at that particular point of uh, delayed union or null union, we are just opening it up the periosteum, making it upside down so that the, all the osteoprogenitor cells, which are lying away from the site, has come to the particular site. And secondly, the next topic is right time you will use the term shingling. Like the blood has been there. The creator blood has also got some effect. And I think uh, this is the right time to introduce the next speaker 
the fifth form of orthobiologics oh sorry six uh, yeah okay fifth form of orthobiologics that is the autologous blood injection yes to my surprise when i entered into this field of orthobiologics last 7 8 years back i came to know in india still people use blood to place it at a delayed and non union site and before that i would like to ask uh, and to have a comment from dr dp bhushan sir for any uh, thing which, uh, which you are missing any point which you are going to place it here before we move to the microscopic level of orthobiology uh, what i wanted to add that when we discuss so many things our common orthopedic surgeons get confused so i will request manish to end up the session with saying this is number 1 graft this is number 2 this is number 3 this is definitely. number 4 and rest is for the discussion definitely sir definitely so that there should be a clear cut message on the biology lagana hai to pehla auto lagana hai dusra ye lagana hai tisra to bhi mein dal dena hai definitely chauthe hai ki nahi kuch ho sake to blood dal definitely definitely right, so right. we will so do manish this, uh, in the end sir definitely sir definitely sir we'll do that thank you, so much. thank you so much so now over to the fifth form of orthobiologics autologous blood injection and prp so prp is also fifth form which everybody knows but we have added the prp and the blood it's almost the same component over to dr malikesh from coimbatore to dr malikesh you can share your screen please yes sir Screen visible, sir. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. So first and foremost, I like to thank Dr. Manish Kanna sir for giving me this opportunity to present in front of all these stalwarts and being a part of this program. And a very uh, congrats to the sir for organizing this in a great way and uh, incorporating lot of talks. So, beginning on my uh, talk, it is about autologous blood injections and orthopedics. Of all the previous talks, sir, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Please. I heard one beep sound. Yeah. Uh, listening to all the previous talks, uh, my topic is about autologous blood injections. This is from the historical uh, historical perspective. How it all began before the advent of all these concentrating procedures or all this uh, polymers came into existence. Even in the 19th century, this procedure was going on. so beginning coming to the history of uh, this thing so what is autologous blood injections so i by definition it states that autologous blood therapy also known as uh, autologous blood injections or auto hemotherapy comprises certain types of hemotherapy using a person's own blood that's it it is like auto hemo and using it as a therapy so what are the various forms historically that has been used is one is oxygenated forms ozonized form ultraviolet exposure form or centrifugation forms like uh, later on it developed into a lot of advances like uh, prps and autologous condition serum so what are the mechanism in simple words there are two mechanisms like one is that in a already a dead site it provides an inflammation or an irritation to uh, like the since it's a dead site there is no process happening it process like a trigger Uh, creating an inflammation at that site and helping in the healing process that is the older or crude way uh, of understanding the mechanism but later on on the upcoming studies we have found that the exact mechanism is like it has laid a lot of cell mediated factors and growth factors through which and uh, various forms of autologous blood can uh, result in the various uh, advantages and bone healing mechanisms which we come across so what are all the growth factors this is in the crude form of uh, autologous blood transfusion uh, we can just understand what are the many growth factors present such like it contains epidermal growth factors fibroblast growth factors transformation growth factors tgf alpha beta platelet derived growth factors or even insulin like growth factor 1 so the, we have to understand the fact the fact that this was in era prior to the all the centrifugation processes purification processes so on a crude way uh knowing that lot of uh, growth factors are there and uh, many scientific uh, stalwarts and doctors were just directly injecting just a unpurified form of autologous blood into the site where they needed the result so uh, looking into the scientific evidence uh, the most uh, prominent studies which i could come up uh, come across was 
the use of hot log of blood in patients for refractory lateral epicondylitis. Here, what they studied was in about uh, some uh, 20 to 27 to 20, 30 patients, uh, which were all treated by non-clinical uh, conservative measures with a, where healing was not adequate. They all underwent treatment where directly autologous blood was injected. And the study claimed that on a long term, yes, it provided results. It provided even a better functional outcome when compared to conservative therapy. So if you go ahead and uh, in the upcoming later years, that is in early 2000s, I would say, where even uh, even that PRP and stem cells had not yet come into the picture that much. They were uh, contemplating between whether PRP should be put autologous blood or corticosteroid injections, which we know after uh, so many years, like in 2023, we know that corticosteroids uh, are not going to give an uh, effect in a long term. There are better alternatives available. But these studies were all done in the previous eras. So there, uh, comprising all this, uh, I would like to summarize this in short of time. Uh, what they say is, like for a short term, always steroids give a better result. But when we take it for a long term, results are PRP gives a very good result. But the interesting thing to note that this autologous blood injections came second in both of these things. So it is, it is not very inferior or it is not superior also. Uh, in olden days, in crude forms, yes, it was providing a result, which is we can take it as it is like second to PRP for a long-term outcome. Other important fields where these were uh, conducted was in other tendinitis conditions like plantar fasciitis, where also it provides it proven to be a slightly more beneficial when compared to corticosteroid. And then also petalar tendinosis, and uh, in spine, such as to prevent the post-lumbar uh, puncture headaches. And then also preventing chronic recurrent temporomandibular joint dislocations. But coming to our study and our topic of discussions in regarding bone defects, autologous blood injections as a crude way has not been proven to be very successful. It is the newer research what we are doing and uh, along with Indian stem cell study group, the various derivatives, that proves to be more effective than just plain autologous blood injections. That I would like to highlight. And uh, summarizing the take home points is autologous blood injections was given first in the 19th century. Uh, the most important thing is the refinement of over the years. Yes, we all know it began uh, early, but uh, how we refine it is very, very important. There are various forms like PRP and ozonization. Still, uh, only in certain conditions, direct autologous blood injection holds good. But in our uh, area of research or area of talk today for bone defects, or plain simple autologous blood injections do not uh, prove or provide adequate results. It is a subsequent derivative form, which uh, is the way forward moving uh, into future generations. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for pointing out such an important, uh, this is a very important topic actually, autologous blood injection. And to summarize, we will say the regenerative orthopedics started from the blood using a blood. And if you're using a blood, still being used at places, simply we are using the platelets, nothing else. But the add on WBC or RBC would create a problem. So please do not use it. And I, I, when I decided all these topics, I thought ki we should go for the publication. Till date, there is no publication acceptable except that in the tendonitis and all these conditions. Yes, yes. I would also like to highlight that. Yeah, blood blood is being used. So right now, as been pointed out by uh, Dr. D.P. Bhushan, sir, uh, we should rule it out that is it it is to be useful anyway and the prp is of course important but since we were covering the entire umbrella so we have to introduce topic thank you so much now going to the fifth form uh, sorry uh, okay now before moving ahead i think we have got a wonderful case discussion for uh, the delayed union the role of prp since the prp is a very important thing and at a microscopic level means at a level of a district hospital and for the general orthopedic surgeon skin specialists they're using, I mean, everybody is using it. So PRP 
is wonderful to be used in delayed union, non-union cases. No need to go for a BMAC. And I think with this case discussion, which is going to on by Dr. Adit Narula from Kanpur, we're going to appreciate it. Over to Dr. Adit Narula for the case of role of PRP in delayed union. Dr. Adit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. So I'll just share my screen. Yeah, please. So is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Please go ahead. Okay. okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Manish Anna, sir, for uh, letting me present this uh, topic of PRP in delayed union. I would like to emphasize here that uh, uh, Please do my colleague, uh, Dr. Manikesh, uh, Your screen sharing mode is... Uh, yes, sir. Please go for a slideshow mode. Sorry, slideshow mode. So it can be visible to all. This one. Yeah. Is it visible now, sir? Yeah, it's not in the slideshow mode, actually. If there's any problem, you can go ahead in the same manner also. That's not a thing. So PRP yes. is the most important thing. And uh, nowadays, I think with the dictionary of PRP available, there should not be any concern of a delayed union for any uh, internal fixation. If your CRM is there, if your uh, centrifuge is there, mm -hmm. uh, the maximum benefit can be given to the orthopedic uh, patients and can so is it is it fine now sir no no it's not so if there is any issue you can uh, like the second present if it's yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead please go ahead all right so uh, uh, coming to the topic of uh, delayed union delayed union uh, occurs when a bone fails to unite within an average anticipated time for a given fracture healing time varies with location and configuration as well as a specific bone and age group Bone healing or fracture healing is a proliferative physiological process in which the body facilitates the repair of bone fracture. So now uh, coming to PRP and its advantages, and uh, platelet rich plasma is a concentration of blood uh, platelet suspended in a small volume of plasma, which has already been discussed by my colleague uh, Dr. Malikesh just in the previous slide. PRP actually helps to enhance healing by delivery of various growth factors and cytokines in form of alpha granules contained in the platelets. And the PRP amplifies the surge of chemical mediators to the microenvironment of the injured area. So what we have done is the inclusion criteria in which all cases of long bone fractures treated either conservatively or operatively with no or poor signs of union and patients were above the age of 18 years. Exclusion criteria just to rule out any pathological fractures, old neglected fractures, fractures with implant failures, or patients with any comorbidities, which is not allowing the fracture to heat and presence of any uh, local or systemic infections. The, coming to the preparation part of the PRP, uh, and, uh, PRP is prepared by a process known as differential centrifugation. In differential centrifugation, acceleration force is adjusted to sediment certain cellular constituents based on different specific gravity and initial centrifugation to separate uh, RBCs is followed by second configuration to concentrate platelets, which suspend in a uh, smallest final plasma volume. The first spin, which is at the rate of 1800 RPM for 10 minutes, is performed at a constant acceleration to separate RBCs from the remaining uh, 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 volume of the blood. After the first spin, uh, the upper layer, which contains mostly platelets and WBC, the intermediate thing there, which is a buffy coat, uh, and that is rich in WBCs, and the bottom layer is mostly RBCs. For the production of pure PRP, upper layer and a superficial buffy coat is transferred to an empty sterile tube. For the production of leukocyte rich PRP, the entire buffy coat along with few RBCs are transferred. The second spin, which is at 3,500, uh, for uh, around 10 minutes is performed. The second spin should be just adequate enough to uh, information of soft pellets. And that is the combination of erythrocyte and platelet at the bottom of the tube. The upper portion of the volume is that is composed of platelet poor plasma is removed. The pellets are homogenized in the lower uh, one third, that is approximately five ml of plasma to create PRP, which is then activated with uh, CACL2, 10% CACL2. This is just a diagrammatic representation of uh, what I just told. The infiltration method is either done under sedation or short anesthesia in the operating room under strict aseptic precautions. The platelet concentrate is transferred uh, to a 10 ml syringe uh, and an 18 gauge or a 20 gauge long stainless 
needle or uh, lumbar puncture needle can be used. The needle is inserted uh, to the delayed immune site under CM guidance, and micro trauma is incited at the site by multiple pricks. The platelet concentrate is infiltrated into a delayed union site. Uh, so infiltration rate is three injections four weeks apart. Uh, this is the uh, criteria and under which we uh, have lined up our cases. This is a rust scoring method in which, uh, as per the cortex uh, keras formation and the fracture line, we can uh, label it. So, see, coming to the case one, this is the proximal humerus uh, fracture, which was fixed in uh, virus. And uh, we can see the fracture line at uh, five months since injury. Uh, this rust scoring of uh, three, and we have injected platelet around the three times. And at nine months, we can see complete union with a rust score of 16, which is complete union. Coming to the case number two, in which at uh, five months uh, post surgery, there is minimal callus formation and uh, the rust score of four. At six months, we can see adequate callus formation with a rust score of 12, which shows that PRP has led to uh, effective bone union in cases of delayed. In case of delayed union, it has led to effective bone union. Conclusion, plated with plasma, uh, has growth factors infiltrated locally and are effective in treatment of delayed union of long bones. The highest incidence of delayed bone union was seen after surgical treatment of femur shaft, uh, especially in middle one-third fractures and distal tibia fractures, which were treated by intermedial nailing. Patriot dish plasma infiltrated locally is effective in the treatment of delayed union of long bones. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. And before we move to the Next topic of my progenitor cells. Any questions by uh, our stalwarts to be asked uh, before moving? Okay, fine. So we'll uh, please stop sharing your screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'll share now coming to the more microscopic form. Yes, that is a uh, I've changed my uh, computer, so there is some issues here coming. Sorry for that, but I'll not make you wait. Yeah, I'm here now. Hopefully, yes, it's going to work. So progenitor cells, yes, progenitor cells are they are nothing actually, but a more uh, specific form of uh, regenerative potential cells. Truly speaking, what we have discussed till now is hematopoietic stem cells, mesenchymal stem cell. Now we are focusing on some undifferentiated type of cells which are been there in the BMAC which are been there in your bone marrow spread, which you're going to concentrate and to utilize it. They are the biological cell that can differentiate into specific cell type. So they, they have a common stem cells and progenitor cell are almost the same as their abilities common. However, the stem cells are less specific than progenitor cells. Why we are talking about the progenitor cell is that these are the masters unspecialized cells, as I've already mentioned, which are capable of dividing. We are dealing with the, see, we are taking out a bone marrow aspirate and making the concentrate form and utilizing it in an autologous uh, manner to a delayed union site, to uh, avian head of the femur or whatever the indication is all about, just to have a pericrine effect, just to stimulate the progenitor cells, which are being present almost there at that particular point where we want to interact, maybe a delayed union, maybe a non-union, maybe a avascular head of femur or a talus or whatever it may be. So these progenitor cells, they are the cells which are lying in between the fully differentiated cell of that organ. Organ means that bone for us, joint for us, and the stem cells. So they have a capability. For example, uh, just to make it very short and clear and crispy. In orthopedics, we are more affaired with the uh, angiogenesis, the non-union, the delayed union, and the less vascularity. So the endothelial progenitor cells so these are the cells which are being required, which are being recruited to the site of ischemia to make the blood vessels grow. 
how they grow. So they produce the vascular endothelial growth factor. Similarly, uh, this is a slide here explaining how the these endothelial progenitor cells, they do a paracrine effect by secreting the vascular endothelial growth factors, which will help in angiogenesis, which will help in remodeling the collaterals. Because once the vessel is damaged, we are not going to develop another vessel. We are just stimulating the collateral formation, which is almost a normal procedure, but we are just accelerating it. Or we are just accelerating to uh, help the these blessed vessels to proliferate, to have a more uh, sprouting to be done by this PRP therapy or BMAC therapy. So neuroangiogenesis, uh, I want to emphasize here that angiogenesis, which we, I think I missed some slide. Okay, fine. So the angiogenesis, which is being produced technically in regenerative orthopedics, wherever we do an angiogenesis, wherever we produce angiogenesis, actually we are producing a neuroangiogenesis. That means whenever we are using a distractor for Elizaro, for just fixator, for any damn thing for years together, we are just producing a ligamentotaxis by using different type of distractor. Actually, we are producing a osteogenesis, histogenesis, neuroangiogenesis. And believe me, it is simply the job of progenitor cell, nothing to go for a bone marrow aspirate, nothing to go for a PRP, anything else. Simply the progenitor cells at that particular point go to give this wonderful effect. Now, two progenitor cells are important for orthopedic surgeons. Osteoblast progenitor cell, osteoprogenitor cells, they differentiate into osteoblast and express progressively the markers. So we see in the blood investigation, alkaline phosphatase has been raised, uh, raised. So it is showing the activity of osteoblast, osteoblastic progenitor cell. Maybe even a tumor marker, a tumor uh, progression is maybe there. Bone derived growth factors secreted by the osteogenic progenitor cell do the job of what we require. So osteogenic progenitor cells are the precursors to osteoblast, which convert into osteocyte. Now coming to the second, third aspect, chondrogenic progenitor cells. So they are the population of the cells which are capable of having a chondrogenic dif differentiation. And I think as it was being mentioned very well in initially also, the time is changing nowadays. We are not saying that the arthroplasty is going to finish in this population of the India. There are so many people are there which are away from the use of regenerative science, it should be used. So the chondroprogenitor cells present at a patient's early osteoarthritis or maybe early rheumatoid arthritis, they do the job of chondrogenesis if we can stimulate them. That means what? That means simply the formation of chondroblast, which are going to do the job for uh, you know secreting extracellular matrix and having a thick, wonderful uh, cartilage or the converting finally into chondrocytes which will be uh, doing a nutrition diffusion and matrix repairing. And the growth factors, yes, all the PRP produce uh, growth factors, all the MSCs produce growth factors, all the mononuclear cells have been there or HSCs has been there for the growth factors and the growth factors of the local progenitor cells. For orthopedics, these are the very important growth factors which I mentioned in the last part. That is the fibroblast growth factor secreted by the MSCs or secreted by the progenitor cells or secreted by the platelets. They do a wonderful job in osteogenesis as well as in the cartilage regeneration. And similarly, the platelet-derived growth factor which will only come from the platelet will do the job. So these are the things which are very important to be taken care of when we uh, talk about the progenitor cells. Thank you so much for the patient hearing. And I think... Uh, we are now into the last phase, a very important phase that is the exosome. And before, without finishing this topic, I think the orthobiologic list is not going to complete it. Just hold your sheet, uh, seats for Dr. Madan Jairaman from Chennai for the sixth form of orthobiologics, which is the most upcoming. And I think in a decade of time, uh, we'll be having something, you know, in the shelf to have a ready-made exosomes as been sh uh, shown here in the slide form within a decade of time, by the time we will be out and the younger generation would be fully in. Thank you so much. Over to Dr. Madan Jairaman. Very good evening. Myself, Dr. Madan Jairaman from Laditambi Medical College and Hospital. I'm here to present on the newer orthobiologic named exosomes. So exosomes are nothing but they are uh, basically nanomedicine product, which is derived from uh, all the tissues of the body, right from hair to nail. So in this autobiology, we are concentrating more on MSC-derived exosomes, that is mesenchymal stromal cells-derived exosomes. We can divide exosomes into small extracellular vesicles and large extracellular vesicles. 
In small, we do have exomere, exosomes, and ectosomes. In large extracellular vesicles, we have microsomes, apoptotic bodies, and large oncomeres. So, how do exosomes form? Whenever there is a micromolecule, cytokines, growth factors, all these things will get endocytosed and it forms early endosome and it uh, enlarges to form a late endosome. And when it integrates with Golgi apparatus, it releases MVB, that is multivesicular bodies. From this multivesicular bodies, they are exocytosed and form exosome release. This exosome, once released into the extracellular matrix, it integrates with the extracellular matrix and it will form a target. and target cargo, this cargo reaches the target site and uh, exerts its action. So uh, basically it is a lipid localization, it is a lipid bilayer, cholesterol, polyglyc uh, polyglycerol, coagulated fat, etc. And uh, these has surface uh, recognition proteins such as CD63, CD9, CD81 and these are all very important for su surface markers and it has uh, molecular DNA release recognition also with the help of nucleic acid uh, which is present in the cell and it uh, the surface modifications can be done for the target delivery and how to quantify it we can quantify uh, it by image analysis molecular imprinting and flow cytometry and other methods to isolate exosomes are microfluidic chips surface charging and um, ALP that is placental alkaline phosphatase which helps in uh, I mean there are a lot many methods to isolate exosomes these are the few methods which I have mentioned here so this MSC derived exosomes are nothing but this uh, it is a basically lipid bilayer that is cholesterol which is mentioned here so these are all the surface markers which we can use to identify the exosomes in the product and it has both immune factors and growth factors which helps in the targeted action. So what property does it has? It has long body circulation that is whole body it will circulate and it has each and every exosome has a particular compartment that is called compartmentalization. The exosomes which present in the bone marrow has a uh, property of bone marrow which uh, present in the liver has property of a liver and it uh, possesses the action of targeted delivery. It uh, delivers at the target site of action um, without spilling into the of nearby environment and it is moreover it is 100% uh, biocompatible and safe it has cargo protection and encapsulation also so it never gets degraded unless and until it reaches the target it has high penetration and biodegradable capacity and enhanced biodistribution inside the body so these are all the uh, how to say these are all the strategies and uh, principles of exosomes it is a, a, a delivery vehicle and it delivers the Cargo. The cargo contains cytokines, chemokines, uh, nucleic acid, all those things. And it, it is uh, regulated by the help of gene expression. So once we give BMAC to the patient with osteoarthritis, to check how this BMAC has worked in a micromolecular way, there comes uh, prognosticated markers of uh, exosomes. And it can reprogram the target cell. If we want to convert uh, sickle cell anemia, for example, uh, sickle cell anemia into a normal blood. So it can reprogram the target cell. The sickle cell anemic blood, sickling uh, blood RBC can be converted into a round or oval shaped RBC, whatever it is. And it helps in inter and intra communication signaling and it improves the cell survival and proliferation. It, it uh, helps in cellular differentiation and devoids of neoplasia. Uh, it has immunomodulation also, so it doesn't cause any immunogenicity. A main property is it induces neoangiogenesis. And these exosomes can be used as a diagnostic and prognostic mark biomarkers for all the diseases, not only degenerative orthopedic disorders, but also cancers as well. So MSC-derived exosomes, we have done a uh, few papers on it which we try to evaluate on knee osteoarthritis. And uh, this is our recent paper. So what we found out is it is a less inherent risk than other stem cell and cell based therapies. non replicability of exosomes, hence no risk of malignant transformation, less immunogenic response towards infection and cancers. It acts exactly in the site of targeted tissue that is called nanomedicine target.
So one such paper I have found out in a rat model of osteoarthritis where bone marrow MSE exosomes have been uh, delivered at the site of cartilage defect, which, uh, which shows a good uh, cartilage formation, which is shown here. So how to do engineered exosomes? Exosomes are normal exosomes we can derive from uh, native uh, any uh, cell. How to do engineered exosomes? When you want to do engineered extracellular vehicles or exosomes, the targeted DNA or RNA should be uh, added up by a vector. That is viral vectors and non-viral vectors are there. We can code the vectors and we can, we can change the gene of interest. That's what I uh, told in the example of sickle cell anemia. Then we have found, uh, we have uh, explored the uses of uh, MSC derived extracellular vehicles in wound healing. We preloaded, I mean, preloaded with the bio scaffolds uh, with chitosin or uh, chondroitin meshwork. It helps in faster healing than the normal cell surface. And one more paper which we found out uh, in uh, fracture healing, they included uh, umbilical cord MSC derived exosomes in a hydrogel which has healed the fracture. Faster restoration is anticipated here. Hence, uh, exosomes are a cellular product. Uh, with, these are called cell-free uh, nanoparticles, which helps in the targeted delivery. So further studies have to be explored to see the biosafety and biodistribution of these products to utilize in the clinical applications. Thank you. Thank you so much for excellent presentation. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, I think uh, exosome is the future, which soon will be there in the market. And now we have done our job of completing this seven, eight hours of topics into one and a half hour. And before winding off and asking our stalwarts uh, for any questions, I just want to summarize everything which we have discussed uh, for the last one and a half hour. So starting from first form of orthobiologics, so when I was a student and everybody, the senior professors who are here were students, we were just playing with a bone graft only the autologous bone graft, still autologous bone graft is very safe, but there are certain challenges where we are, can't use an autologous bone graft, especially in the avian head of the femur to do the needful, where we need osteogenesis actually. And that is why uh, uh, we have come across to the second form of orthobiology, that is the BMAC. So bone marrow aspirate, which we were using, and the BMAC concentrate, which is a wonderful autologous preparation, no need, no risk, uh, in the OT, it can be done very well. So this is the second form of orthobiologics, which we not we, we, we want to add. But the problem is, we can't add a BMAC to a uh, Alecris graft. It's of no use. It's going to not going to have store in route. That is why we come to the third form of orthobiologics. That is the uh, demineralized bone graft, collagen and collagen products. But again, the issue is. With the collagen and collagen products, since they are again a demineralized form, the cost has been there, some chances of infection has been there. It's not very much popular, but definitely, yes, we should not forget the third component beside collagen and non-collagen protein, that is bone morphogenic protein. That is why if you're using an autologous graft, not, not an allogenic graft, definitely not. We are not going to focus on again freeze and freeze diet form, which is again a theoretical part at this moment of time for the general orthopedic surgeon. But yes. BMP, that is the third form of the orthobiologics, have to be respected to be taken care of and to be utilized as much as possible. Now, coming to the fourth form of the orthobiologics, which we clinically use most of the time, that is the bone graft substitute. And as very well mentioned at that time also, the G bone, the hydroxypatite crystals, which we are using it, alone using is of no use. So we need to again add a BMAC concentrate on it or a MSC, which will be very costly or a PRP, of course, it can do the job. And we need to remember that whenever we are selecting a bone graft to be taken commercially, we should see what, what is the osteoconductive property, what is the osteoinductive property and osteogenesis for which definitely these are not sufficient. We need to add a BMAC or any uh, thing which can produce a growth factors, which we have discussed. And uh, the fifth form uh, after this was autologous blows and injection, which is obsolete, which is useless. So the PRP is the fifth form, which is the most basic form can be used at a grassroots level and is very much permeable also with all the uh, you know authorities. Of course, we have to go for a always for a, a proper consent these days. 
And the sixth form, progenitor cells, is again a microscopic form. We try to stimulate the patient's progenitor cells to get the response, not depending upon the MSCs, not depending upon the exosomes, which are costly. And the last sixth form is the most, most best form. But again, these MSC derived exosomes are not so much available, not being utilized. And for orthopedic surgeon, we are not so much bothered about the liver problem and other problems. So for orthopedic surgeon, but yes, in a due course of time, we'll be having ampules after a decade of time in which the MSC derived exosomes would be available. So this is a concise form of this today, one and a half webinar. Now over to uh, the Dr. Oganandan, Professor Bhushan, for any comments before we'll request the vote of the thanks and the carry over message from Dr. Vishnu and our Secretary General for Indian Stem Cell Study Group, Dr. Kanchan Mishra. Over to uh, our uh, stalwarts here. Dr. Agnanda, for any comments, Dr. Bhushan, sir. Now I think the message is very much clear. Yes. Dr. Bhushan, sir. What I wanted, you have spoken. And this is the nutshell which should be derived and demonstrated and to be sent to all the orthopedic surgeons over India. True, sir. True. I, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we have just concentrated the safe six, seven hours of book of orthobiologics into a one and a half hour time. Thank you so much. So uh, without wasting time, first of all, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Vishnu Santhil for any add-on thing which we have missed. I missed while explaining the take-home messages. Dr. Vishnu. Uh, from, uh, yeah. Good evening, sir. And yeah. uh, it was an excellent, uh, uh, concise uh, form which you have given, sir, because this uh, type where uh, the first form, the second form, the third form, so it is useful for all the postgraduates and all the orthopedicians who are working in periphery or who are working in medical colleges and also in advanced, uh, like Dr. Madan who is having a stem cell lab. So he is now in advanced doing exosomes. So it gives a wide array of things. So which a uh, common orthopedician has a knowledge about it and he can use it depending upon his uh, technical skills and depending upon the availability and which is there because, and we have uh, done this program from the start, from the basics how the bone grafts, what is the properties of the bone grafts, the different type of bone grafts. Then we have gone to the bone graft substitutes, demineralized, then the nanoparticles, then the latest, the bioengineering and the use of the exosomes in various treatment of uh, joint preservation surgeries and everything, sir. So that was excellent to flow in the program. And I also thank uh, Dr. Navala Dishankar, sir, and Dr. Ragunandan, sir, who are doing a pioneering work in Chennai in orthobiologics to, to have their uh, go spend their time in this uh, webinar and giving their inputs, valuable inputs in uh, two cases which, are, which were presented uh, very well, uh, showing the infective bone graft and also the use of uh, PRP in uh, delayed uh, bone healing. So, so these types, so that, so that newer, these types of technology can be used in non-invasive methods for giving a better patient care. And also I, we as on behalf of our Secretary General, and also I thank the IOA core team for giving us this opportunity to conduct a very uh, beautiful seminar, sir, which was very informative to everyone, sir. Thank, thank you, you so you, much. Sir. Thank you so much. And we'll request gradually to Dr. D.P. Bhushan, sir, and also to Maharishi, to send a link for this, for this one and a half hour gist so that we can make it viral because this is a very important topic, which is very well, uh, which we, we can utilize very well if we understand this topic very well. Now over to our backbone of the association, Secretary General, Dr. Kanchan Mishra for his final remarks. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Manish. Uh, before going to some, um, uh, I think some point, uh, I would like to thank to uh, Dr. Atul Sirosto, IOA President and President elected Dr. Ram Chandra, Vice President Dr. Arnu Agrawal, and Secretary General Dr. Navin Thakar, and also uh, our ICG President Dr. Alok Agrawal, and uh, thank you Dr. Manishar, you too also. Uh, you will all have the uh, organized very uh, wonderful webinar, very uh, and uh, very informative. That's, uh, and uh, also I would like to thank all respected faculty who chaired the session today. And all the beautiful speakers, they have the very informative uh, masses. Uh, I, even I learned many things today. So that's a great thing. Even this, uh, I think Dr. Mani, this bone grafting, I think that is related to, I think 
not directly, but it's, it's related to vascularization and angiogenesis, right? So, uh, I, you know, the growth factor, they can increase the angiogenesis. The, okay. If we, there is a, any correlation, we can combine, we can treatment or the, in the bone clotting with the PRP treatment or not. Yeah, we, we can we can combine and definitely yes. Uh, I think uh, if you, if I remember, you have pointed out about the bone banks. So what yeah. we are discussing about the freeze dries and whatever the things are the again the future and in right. India it is going to be there and we will try sometime to organize a CME of our bone bank also, which is a part of the first part of the uh, orthobiologics. Yeah. Because yeah, because of the material, material is very important. The biobankings are very. I think future aspect of the this the orthobiology. And uh, there are many, uh, I think in India also, where many people have started with the biobanking, even uh, yeah, bone banking. Uh, also in the Surat, we are thinking to go for the, bio, bio, the bone banking. Yeah, so it is yeah, it is the new things. But definitely and, we have not focused on that part because this webinar, this uh, links are being going for a general orthopedic surgeon who are in periphery also. So we should be touching for the basic thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Kanchan, for your input. Now, I, before winding off, over to Dr. D.P. Bhushan for the final thing. He's a convener of our uh, group. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Ragunandan. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Navaldi Shankar. All the estimate, my fellows, my buddies, all these, they are the young orthopedic surgeon I'm proud of, and they will be going to take over the things, the flags, which we are just trying to raise it off. Dr. Bhushan. Thank you, Dr. Manish, <clears throat> and all the stalwarts. It was a really well addressed seminar or webinar, and the message we wanted to deliver is delivered. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Raghunandan, sir, anything from your input before we wind off? Your mic is muted. We can't hear you. Your mic is muted. Uh, just one thing. Yeah. So, the new generations, you know, who are more focused into autobiotics, please do not forget the basics. Basics That's are always there. That is a pillar. Okay. Thank you so much. So thank you so much for the, that. especially for the shingling. Yeah. Still, it is the best. Now with the knowledge of orthobiologics, we are able, able to find out how it was working. See, yes. I, I found out in 1995. At that time, my professor used to ask me to do a lot of shingling. Now for the last four years, I am to understand how it's going to work. So everything is the same, but basic is the backbone B and B. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being a part of this wonderful webinar. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.